morning, church. Welcome to this gathering of SBC Groveland. My name is Shelby Minnick, and I'm the student director here at SBC Groveland. If you are a guest with us and you got one of these orange cards, we just ask you to fill it out. This helps us to get some information for you. You can also just scan the QR code on the back if you don't have a pen or don't feel like writing. I understand. Or you can text the number. That will be on the screen. There it is. Text the number and just text the word welcome. And that just helps us to get some information about the church, answer any questions you may have, all that good stuff. Just a few announcements I want to draw your attention to. We are really excited. This um, year we are starting a children's choir. This will be for kindergarten through fifth grade. And so on Wednesday nights, we already have a prayer meeting time for adults and we have youth group. But now kids, you guys get to be involved and we have a kids choir. So we're very excited about that. That will be starting on Wednesday evenings at September 14th at 6.30, and it will go for about an hour, so until about 7.30 when the prayer gathering is also over. The last thing is that we have a membership class, so if you've been visiting with us for a while and would like to know more about becoming a member, on August 31st at 6.30, we will be having a membership class, and you can sign up for that by texting MEMBER to the number that is on the screen. It's the same number for everything, so if you've texted it once, you'll be good. You just have to text another word. We do want to thank Mr. Robert and Holiday here for being our worship director, our worship pastors today. We're so excited to have them. We had them last week and it was a great time, wasn't it? So we are very excited to have them. And today's very exciting because we get to celebrate in baptism. So let's go ahead and do that. Good morning, church. How's everybody? I want to welcome you today to this gathering of FBC Groveland. We're excited to gather for worship and excited to celebrate with Zoe. Zoe, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes. Amen. Zoe and I have met uh, a couple of times. She and her brother Odin and their grandmother Lisa Priola. And so we now come together to baptize you in the name of the Father the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is young Mr. Odin. And Odin and I have had similar conversations. Odin, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Amen. Do you commit to walk with him and live for him? Yes. Amen. Well, then I baptize you as my brother in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's pray together. Father, we are thankful for what you've done in the hearts of children. And God, we're thankful, Father, that you are the author of salvation. And so, God, we know, Lord, that this water does not save. God, we know this water does not uh, have any qualities to it of, that bring any kind of salvation. But, Father, this water is a picture of death and burial and resurrection. Father, this water is a picture of what you have done for us. The cross, the cross, the, the body of Jesus buried and then three days later rose again. And so, Lord, we pray for these children. Pray, God, that they would walk in newness of life, as your scripture says. We thank you. In Jesus' name, we all say together, amen, amen. amen. Would you guys lead us in worship? All right, let's get up on our feet. God, we thank you, Lord. This is the time we get to bring you a sacrifice of praise. God, open our hearts for that. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name. Look at somebody and say, there's joy in the house of the Lord. And that's not just the house of the Lord. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. There's joy in you. And when that joy comes out, then it'll fill this house. Amen? Amen. Come on, you guys help us out.
worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. Our God, he holds a victory. been through something difficult like yesterday, yesterday. 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 like this morning life brings you test we've been tested this morning even with the sound system but God is good God can turn your test into a what testimony. a testimony amen. amen and before I'm gonna declare a testimony right now One, let's sing together two Vamp, two, three, four. Intro. Verse one. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle Get over, it's my name, his registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. That's what the word of God says. It's in you. The miracle that I just can't get over. It's my name, his registered in heaven. Yes, my praise. Be 
sound awesome. The worship last week stayed with me all week. I was, every day I thought about when I could hear y'all sing, it just, it was so encouraging. Amen. How much more did God love it? Let's keep it going. Amen. Hallelujah. God is so faithful. Jesus. 
together. Father God, we just come right now. God, we praise you and we worship you and we are thankful for what you've done in our hearts and our lives. God, we're thankful for all that you have done. We thank you, Lord, for the cross. We thank you, Father, for loving us before we ever loved you. Father, my prayer right now is for us as a church that we would not sing this song and lie while we'll sing it. Father, I pray that we are not lying to ourselves or to you. Lord, we, we sing, Father. We sing that we will, we will walk, we will go, we will do, we will trust. Father, may we not be singing a lie. God, I pray that you would, you would show us and convict us this morning to trust you with everything, to walk with you diligently, faithfully, to believe and to know the truth of who you are and how radically, Lord, that that changes us. So, Father, I pray that we would sing the song and sing it in truth. And God, and mean every single word, Lord, that we say. And I pray it for myself, and I pray it for my family and my friends who have gathered this morning. God, may we be people who are willing, Lord, willing to go and to walk and to trust. Lord, we love you. We worship you. We are so thankful for your grace and mercy. We pray these things in your powerful name. And we all say together, amen, amen. Would you turn and say hello to somebody this morning? Just welcome somebody here. Amen. As you are seated, as you're seated, would you um, just let Robert and Holiday uh, know how much we appreciate them helping us out this week? Yeah, so good. Um, Benjamin will be back uh, next Sunday. He's been out for the last two Sundays because his brother got married up, uh, in, I think, in Tennessee. Uh, so they've been up there with family and celebrating all of that. Uh, so he'll be back with us next week. And um, guys, we, uh, we, we pushed through some of the tech issues, and the Lord is honored with, with the praise of his people. So uh, thank you guys for leading us and for the church. You guys, uh, I, don't, I don't get it often to be able to stand over here and worship with you. It seems like I'm normally on the drums or doing something else on the stage. Um, but it is good to hear you guys sing. I love hearing y'all sing. So good. Uh, this morning, we are picking back up where we've left off. We're in Acts chapter 13. So uh, the, the first book um, after the gospel. So, um, so we would go, what we go, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the book of Acts. It's in the New Testament. Uh, Acts, and we're at um, Acts 13. Now, let me ask this question while you're turning there. Um, has anyone here ever been on a road trip? Anybody ever done a road trip? by waving hands. Uh, what kind of road tripper are you? Okay, and, and here's, here are my questions. Uh, what kind of road tripper are you as in? Uh, do you plan it out every moment of your road trip, or do you let it go with the flow kind of thing? I'd love to hear you. Talk back to me. You're a planner outer or a go with the flower? All right, let's do a raise of hands. Planner, planner outer, you got it all planned. You know exactly. Some of you with the raised hands, I, I would have expected that. I know you. Um, and how many of you go with the flow? You're just going with the flow. That would be myself. Yeah, I'm just going with the flow. And uh, absolutely. My daughter and I, I, we had a big road trip uh, this summer. I told you already some of these stories. And we drove from here to South Dakota. And we didn't have much of a plan. It was just like, let's go. And uh, um, we probably should have done a few more checks on the engine and the car because uh, we broke down uh, outside of Nashville. And uh, it was a, a, a quite an ordeal. But we had a lot of fun. Well, road trips are fun. Good times. Uh, I, I did a quick, um, I, was, I was researching it. And by that, you know, I just, I just Googled it. Uh, what are some road trips, you know, plans for road trips? And uh, here are a few. Here are some things that, uh, it's, a top, it's the top list of what you should do on a road trip. You ready? Get plenty of sleep before you drive. Think about exhaustion before you begin your journey. And right when I read that first one, I'm like, this is a lame road tripper right here. 
Are we serious right now? Um, bring healthy road trip snacks. Okay. Stay hydrated. Are we playing football? What are we? I mean, I don't understand. Um, plan your rest stops. No, we're not playing. No. Uh, here's the one. Here's the one. Chew gum. What? Chew gum. I, I, use energizing scents in your car. Okay. Um, I, I don't know. Here's, here's a great one. Sit up straight. These are the first list of, of what you should do on a road trip. Keep passengers entertained. <laughs> I was like, this is, this is ridiculous. This is terrible. Who wrote this? It sounds like it's written by a corporation. Nationwide Insurance wrote this. <laughs> I'm like, you guys have never been on a cool road trip in your lives. You know, anyway, road trips. Uh, Sherry and I have been on a few of those, and um, we've done a lot of traveling over the years and, and going in uh, different countries and um, what are commonly known as just taking the gospel to different areas, serving churches, commonly known as a, a, like a mission trip. And, um, you know, to go out of the country, you got to have one of these, right? You got to have one of these. So you got to have a passport to get on that, that major, major road trip, you know. And I realized I got to get mine renewed because it's pretty close to being expired. But I love going back through here and just looking at all the different places and the borders and the, the crossings and the things that we've done um, from, from, you know, leaving Orlando to uh, London, England, to Budapest, uh, to, um, uh, which is not a country, but, you know, it's a place, um, to, uh, to uh, Romania, which is a country. I mean, just traveling uh, multiple times, of course, across the Canadian border, uh, back and forth. And there was a day that we crossed the Canadian border or attempted to cross the border back to where we were living at that time. And the guard at the border, they're very particular. They look at Sherry's passport and looking at her and looking at her driver's license. Now, we've been traveling for years with these passports, Is your name Cheryl? No, Sherry's, Sherry's name isn't Cheryl. But her passport said Cheryl. All these years traveling with this passport that said Cheryl on it. They almost didn't let us back into the country. I mean, they were very like, you know, you're not that person. And so finally they let us in because we were like, well, we own a home and we, our kids are in school and all this stuff. So they finally let us back in. But then Sherry had to go down to Vancouver and uh, to the, basically the consulate and had to get things figured out on the passport. And thankfully they believed her. Now that's a fun road trip, you know. That's, that's exciting. You know, I, I found out a long time ago uh, when you cross those borders, you don't answer questions that people aren't asking. You know what I'm saying? You just shut your mouth, okay? You be quiet. You don't go, I know it says Cheryl, but my name is Sherry. Uh-uh, uh-uh. No, we just going to go with the flow. And it's the same thing when you get to where you're going, especially if you're on a mission trip. You're going to go uh, where, the lead, the, where the Lord leads you, right? I will go where you lead me. I will follow, right? I'll go. I will follow where you lead me, right? And when you get there, I will, I will swallow what they feed me, you know? You got you, you to gotta be flexible on a road trip. Well, today in Acts 13, you're like, what in the world are we talking about, Pastor? In Acts 13, we see an epic road trip. I'm just going to say it that way. It's an epic road trip in Acts 13. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible and you've been in church you know, um, throughout the years, you would know this as the, the first missionary journey. That's the, typically the way it's taught. Paul's first missionary journey, which sounds so very boring to me. So I was like, we'll call it a road trip. All right, it's the first road trip. You got three characters on this road trip. And you, you got to learn about people. You really learn about people when you take a road trip, right? Right? They say, don't get married to that person until you've done a little bit of a road trip with that person. And so we've got three characters going on the road trip. Um, and you, if you're following with us, you've been tracking along for the last several weeks. Um, we've been in Acts for quite some time. But you'll remember that a little bit later or earlier, we talked about how the church in Antioch had basically commissioned Paul and Barnabas and sent them out. And that's what we're picking up here. Well, now we've got three characters in the scene. So we've got Paul and Barnabas. You'll see Paul's name mentioned as Saul. But then here in just a few moments, you're going to see his name change to Paul. And there's a reason behind that. And, and we'll probably talk about it when we get there. So you got Barnabas and you got this guy named Paul. And then you have another man named John Mark. 
John Mark would be Barnabas' cousin. John Mark is, is a, a younger man. And so you got these three guys about to, to step out into a major road trip, their first missionary journey. And what I want to do today is just track through Acts 13. We're going to start in verse 4 because we've already covered verses 1 through 3. We're going to start in 4 and we're going to go all the way to 52. Okay, and what we're going to do is look at the three different stops on their road trip. Let's do it that way. Three stops. I think we can learn some things about this trip. I think we can learn some things about uh, from each one of those particular stops. Some things about our own lives, some things about um, our own future, some things that, about how we should be as a church, uh, some things about taking the gospel to other cultures and, and talking about Jesus. Uh, I think we can learn quite a few things. I think we'll also pick up a, a principle from here that will actually help us uh, just in living life. I think we'll see a principle here kind of stand out to us. You guys ready? And so instead of like we normally do, normally we read through the entire chapter, then we come back and talk about it, um, or the section and come back and talk about it. This time, we're just going to read along and then stop and talk about some of those, those ideas. All right. So we're in chapter um, 13, starting in verse 4. We're looking at the first stop on the road trip is Cyprus. It's an island. It's an island. So the first stop is Cyprus. And here we're going to learn several things about the gospel and several things about people, about people in general when we take the message of Christ out of these walls to our neighborhoods and to the nations. I think we can learn a few things here. So let's look at verse 4. We'll read through from verse 4 to verse 12, and then we'll come back and talk about it. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, uh, and from there, they sailed to Cyprus. Arriving in Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. They also had John as their assistant. When they had traveled the whole island, as far as Paphos, they came across a sorcerer, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man, this man summoned Barnabas and Saul and wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimas, Elimas, the sorcerer, that is the meaning of his name, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Let's just stop there for a moment. What I really want you to see, um, if, you're, if you're new to Christianity, or maybe, maybe you're, a, you're a visiting with us this morning, or maybe you wouldn't even call yourself a Christian, a follower of Jesus, you are here on a great Sunday. This is a great day because you're going to hear what we actually believe about Jesus is going to be unpacked through here. But I also, if you're new to the Bible, I want you to pay attention to all of the details, all of the historical facts, the historical details that are unfolded here, such as Sergius Paulus, this proconsul. I mean, all of this is, is in historical records outside of the Bible. And so if you're a skeptic, if you're wondering, are these things actually true or are they just legends? Friends, let me tell you, um, it is not a legend. It is actual historical facts that, that are happening here. I really don't like it, especially in children's ministry, when we say, let's teach them a Bible story. I just don't like the phrasing of Bible story because in a child's mind and in your mind and mine, it sounds like a fable. It sounds like a, a long tale. It sounds like Aesop's fables or something. It sounds like something you might watch on Disney Channel or what have you. Well, the Disney Channel and the Bible don't quite line up anymore, but that's another conversation. So I, it's, not, it's not stories as in fictitious. It's stories as in pulling from history. And so just notice all of the details. Look at verse 9. But Saul, here it is, also called Paul, and from here on, we'll just see his name as Paul. But Saul, also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, stared straight at Elimas and said, You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery, you son of the devil and enemy of all that is right. Won't you ever stop perverting the straight paths of the Lord? Now look, the Lord's hand is against you. You are going to be blind and you will not see the sun for a time. Immediately a mist and darkness fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead, them, lead him by the hand. And in verse 12, Then when he saw what happened, the proconsul believed, 
because he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So what can we learn very quickly from the very first stop on this epic road trip um, going to this island of Cyprus? Why would they go there? Well, for the, for most likely because that is where um, Barnabas is from. We see that elsewhere in Scripture. Barnabas is from there, so Barnabas most likely has family there. So it kind of makes sense to let's go in that general vicinity. Why would they go to Cyprus? Also, John Mark, who is Barnabas' cousin, would also most likely have family there. So they're, they're going to a place that is somewhat familiar and one of the first things that they do, which is kind of Paul's um, motive, it's the way he operates every, most places. He goes to the synagogue first. He goes to the synagogue first. Why? Because elsewhere in Scripture, Paul writes about how the gospel needs to go to the Jews. And then the Jews reject it, and then it goes to the Gentiles. He speaks about this, and so he's following this plan. Why would he go to the synagogue? Well, because also because they have an understanding of the Old Testament, what you and I would commonly know as the Old Testament. They have a a deep, rich understanding of that. And so what we'll see here in just a few moments is when Paul gets to another synagogue, we see how he unpacks the Old Testament and shows how it points to Jesus. So what can we learn in this particular road road stop? Uh, One that apparently by nationwide insurance should be completely planned out. (laughs) Well, the first thing we can learn, I think we can see in verse 7 and uh, just before verse 7, you'll see that some people, some people will be open to the Word of God. There are people that are open to the Word. I know we feel like sometimes nobody wants to hear us talk about Jesus. What they don't want to hear is sometimes the way we talk about Jesus. They, they love, people love Jesus, but they don't necessarily love Christians. And there's an issue with the way we present Jesus at times, especially on social media, friends, especially. And so may we season our talk about Jesus with love and grace and mercy and truth, but do it in a gentle way, a gentle spirit, and again, not to be jerks for Jesus. But we see here some people will be open to the Word of God. This was fascinating to me this past week and actually even yesterday. Uh, And I shared about this, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I've had so many conversations with people from different faiths, different religions, or no religion at all, who want to know what we believe as Christians. And those conversations were started by them and not by me. And so I was on a movie set even yesterday and um, working with several different actors and directors who are all from different places and different countries and speaking different languages. I don't even know what's going on around me at part of the time. And a couple of them a couple of weeks ago came up to me and said, could you tell me, basically I said, could you tell me the difference between what we believe and what you believe? Yeah, I think we could. I think let's have a seat. Let's talk about that. People are open to hear the word of God. We've just got to be willing to talk about it. But talk about him in a way that's not, you know, again, just, just, just rude and, and unintelligent and mean and, and hateful and spiteful because that's the way the culture looks at us, friends. I know most of you, and there's only a couple of you that are mean and hateful and spiteful. <laughs> you see the smile, you hear the sarcasm. There's more than a couple. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, I, but seriously, I know most of you in the room. I do. I know many of you. And I know you are gentle and lovely and beautiful people. And let's let that shine out as we talk about some people will be open to the word. I think we can also see this. It's obvious right here. Some people are going to be opposed to the word. We got this sorcerer. What in the world's going on here? We got this man who's opposing God, who's opposing them talking about God. They're, he's trying to oppose this other individual uh, from hearing God. And so we've got somebody, we've got this, uh, this Sergius, this um, proconsul. Think about who he is, an extremely intelligent person, an, a wealthy person, an influential person. Okay, so that right there goes, it flies into the face of our culture today that says Christianity is just for the dumb and the uneducated. That is not true at all. The hospitals, the, the foster care system, the government, all of these things rest, rest on the shoulders of the teachings of Christ. All of these things were started, for the most part, by Christians. And so it's not an, unintelli- it's not a, it's not a, 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 an unintelligent faith. 
And so we see this individual uh, who is open to the Word of God as somebody who's incredibly influential. But then you got this guy, this, this uh, David Copperfield kind of guy standing off in the corner over here um, doing parlor tricks and stuff, trying to pervert. The words basically mean pervert the Word of God or pervert the path. And so I think we also need to understand that when we go to talk about Christ in our neighborhoods and our nations, we, we need to understand that there will be opposition. We cannot, cannot downplay the amount of spiritual warfare that goes on. The, listen, the enemy does not want you to come to faith in Christ. He doesn't want you to trust Jesus. And he also doesn't want you to talk about Jesus. I have seen crazy things happen when we're sharing the gospel. Sherry was sitting in a—we were at a softball tournament one time. A softball tournament, uh, not just one time. A uh, majority of my, my, uh, my, my 30s were at uh, softball tournaments. Uh, we were at this tournament, and Sherry's having a conversation with a lady about Christ. And it is a great conversation. I can see it. I'm over here at the fence where every dad is at, you know, because every dad expects that their kid's going to be the next wonderful, amazing Derek Jeter type player. You know what I'm saying? And so we're over there with our own stat books. And we're like, why don't you put my kid in the game and all this stuff? But my wife is over there sitting in the, in the stands talking to this lady. And I look over there and, and I know exactly what's going on. And I start praying. And I'm not kidding you. I don't understand how this happened or why this would happen. I'm not saying I understand it, but I tell you this, this girl hits a ball. It's a foul ball. It goes right over, and it just lands in the middle of their conversation. Completely shuts the conversation down. And then I'm like, Lord, what in the world? Why did you let that happen? That's a whole nother message, a whole nother conversation. But you cannot downplay the amount. And I'm like, that's pretty trivial. I get it. But there's a huge amount of spiritual warfare that you and I have no idea about. And some people will oppose the Word of God. But that doesn't mean we don't share the Word of God. And here's something I think we'll see throughout these three stops, if we even make it to all three stops today. Here's what I think we'll see throughout them you're going to see a lot of opposition. And there's something about our culture today. There's something about our children. There's something about my generation. Um, we'll, just, we'll just make it blanket statements here across all generations. We just don't want to do hard things anymore. And just because we come across something that's hard doesn't mean this isn't what the Lord wants us to do. It doesn't mean to turn and go back. It doesn't mean to lay down and give up. It doesn't mean we've missed God just because we come into a hard situation. Now, this is a difficult thing. Now, you've got this influential person who's interested in hearing the words. You've got this, this, uh, you know, this David Blaine guy over here doing parlor tricks. And, in, in, and he's incredibly influential to the, the proconsul because the proconsul is Roman. And the Romans really did, for the most part, had an, a belief that the Jews were um, in touch with God. And then bringing in some of these um, pagan superstitions and all this uh, paganism into the mix of it. This guy over here, that, ha that can do some things. He can do some stuff. That guy over there has a lot of sway over this Roman official. And so all of this is going on. So some people are going to want to hear the word. Some people are going to be opposed to the word. And what I want you to see um, as we just go by this is how the Holy Spirit works through Paul in this moment. And this is a prayer that I would say pray for, or, or this is something that we should pray for ourselves in our church. What does he do? What does he do? Let's look back at verse 8. We see in verse 8 that Elymas, the sorcerer, as the meaning of his name, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away. And look at verse 9. What does Paul do? But Saul, also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, stared straight at Elymas and said, You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery, you son of the devil and enemy of all that is right. Won't you ever stop perverting the straight paths of the Lord? And then he goes on and says, Now look, now look, the Lord's hand is against you. You are going to be blind and will not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and darkness fell on him. I, I, pray, I pray this right here. I, I'm praying this. I'm praying that I would have that kind of boldness. I pray the Holy Spirit. I pray that I would be full of the Holy Spirit, uh, constantly filled with the Spirit, which basically just means here that he had a generous supply of the Spirit of God in him. I pray that that would be true of myself, 
I pray it would be true of you as well, that we would have that type of relationship with Christ, that yes, you have the Holy Spirit, but you would be walking in an overflow of the Spirit, a continual filling of the Spirit. And in that, you would have boldness, boldness. I pray for boldness to have that conversation and to stand up. I pray this also, that we would have insight, insight. Paul knew exactly who he was and what he was. Boldness and insight in the moment. I pray that we would also have power. I pray that we would have power and that God would work through us. And so what happens? God, God makes him blind, which is just basically what he was anyway. He was blind to his sin. He was blind to the ways of God. He was already blind. And what God does in some ways is gives us a great illustration of what was already going on in this man's life. He is completely blind. But God also does what? He brings light. He brings light into the proconsul's life. He brings blindness to that guy, but he brings light. He brings light to the proconsul, to Sergius. Because in verse 12, we learn that some people will believe the word of God. Some people will believe the word. Don't be afraid. Do hard things. Pray in the spirit that the Lord would go before you, fight the battles for you. Trust that God will give you insight and boldness and share the gospel because people will believe the word of God. Darkness fell on the enemy, but light burst into this man's life. And that is our prayer. And that is how God will use you every single day if we allow him to do that. If we pray, God, give me opportunities. Use me today for your glory. He will absolutely do it. I promise you he will do it. Now, the second stop that we have here, um, look at verse 13 and 14. We'll see the second stop. Um, and this is always interesting on a road trip right here. Uh, anybody ever had relational conflicts on a road trip? You ever get in an argument with somebody on a road trip? They're messing with the stereo, the radio. They're changing the podcast, whatever it is you're listening to. They don't want to listen to that book. They want to listen to something else. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got to stop. I got to go. You're always wanting to stop. What in the world? Uh, is that just me? I'm sorry. Relational conflicts. We see it in verse, starting in verse 13. Paul and his companions, before we go much further there, what I want you to do also to notice that before now, up until this point, it was Saul. Of course, you know, we talked about that. And also up until this point, it was Barnabas listed first. It was always Barnabas first and then Saul, or who we commonly know as Paul. Now there's a transition. There's a transition here in verse 13 where it says Paul and his companions. There's something about the leadership has changed. And we'll see throughout the rest of Acts that Paul is the, is the one, is the main one taking the gospel. Paul is setting the, the pace. Paul is the one doing the majority of the teaching. I think this says something about Barnabas in, the, in some really generous ways. Barnabas was known as an encourager, basically what his name means. And we see elsewhere in Scripture where they title him like that as an encourager. A good encourager doesn't have to be the leader, you know. A good encourager looks and finds strengths of people and steps back and allows that person to step up and allow them to lead. He encourages. She encourages. That's what you see. I think partly what you see there, Barnabas, he knows that Paul's a better teacher and Paul is more educated and Paul is able to communicate these things and particularly or potentially in a better way. Uh, he also knows that, that Paul is very driven. I mean, this is a very driven man. We see that throughout Scripture. And so now we see a shift, and we'll see that shift going, or see that from here on out, that Paul is the one listed first. So in verse 9 again, but Saul, also called Paul, filled with the, I'm sorry, not verse 9, excuse me, verse 13, Paul and his companions set sail um, from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. Here it is, but John left them and went back to Jerusalem. But John left them and went back to Jerusalem. I think what we see real fast there is some relational conflict, relational challenges. Is what can we learn from this road trip? We can learn, you know, of course, that not everything is going to go great. That the church, uh, we are a family, and family sometimes disagrees. Amen? Okay, all right. Sometimes families disagree. Amen? I told some people the other day, I've, t I've actually told our deacons, and some of you will think this is crazy. I actually told our deacons, you know, you, if you don't disagree every now and then in the room when we're praying and planning and discussing, if you don't disagree every now and then, you don't need to be in the room. You, you need a little bit of tension. You, you got to have some tension to get traction to make the wheels turn, right? 
You got to have a little bit of tension. Not a lot of tension, but you need a little bit of tension. You know, relational conflicts happen. Paul, or, uh, John Mark leaves. There's all kinds of speculation as to why he leaves. I've heard preachers call him a mama's boy. He wanted to go back home. I mean, there's all kinds of things. Who We really don't know. But we do know that later when John Mark wants to join the team again, well, Paul says, oh, that, that guy's not going on the team. He's not coming back with me. And eventually, we'll even see later where Paul and Barnabas split off and do their own different missions. And John Mark goes with Barnabas and Timothy goes with Paul. So, so there's some relational dynamics that happen inside of churches. I thought churches were great and awesome and got together, all, you know, loved each other all the time. There is a reason why the scriptures say, bear with one another, be long-suffering with one another, basically put up with one another. You got to have some tension to do the one another's, okay? It's a given that we're not always, always going to get along. But here's the thing. Listen to this. We are family. And you might disagree you might disagree around the family table at dinner, but when you walk out that door, you're family, right? Come on. You're family. You're together. So I'd even take it this much. I might would disagree with whatever my brothers did out here in the, in the parking lot or whatever, just whatever illustration or however you want to describe it. Like I might disagree outside the house, but I'll correct it inside the house. Does that make sense? I mean, we might disagree, but we, we're family. And we do eventually see John Mark and Paul reconciled later in Scripture. And think about this. John Mark's the one that authored the Gospel of Mark. So I think things worked out a little bit. And so know this. On, your, on that road trip, that proverbial road trip, you're going to have some conflict. In our lives, we're going to have some conflict around the table as Christians and family here in this place, in this church. And that's not a bad thing as long as it's done in a respectful and healthy way. But seek reconciliation. What does Paul say later? He says, I think it was Paul. I know the scripture says later on, it says, be at peace with everyone. So that, uh, be at peace as long as it's up to you. Do your best is what it's saying. Do your best to be at peace with everybody. And so know that there will be some challenges, but it is not the end of the day. Seek reconciliation. So we see that on, on that second stop, re- relational challenges. But we'll also look at verse 14 quickly. Verse 14, they continued their journey from Perga and reached Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath day, then it goes into Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. So there in verse 14, um, there are also physical challenges. How do, how do we see that? Well, they're on a long journey. This is about 100 miles. The elevation is about 3,600 feet. Uh, the road they're taking is a road that is known for robbers. It's a road that's known for flooding. Uh, you can read about this in history. Uh, it's, a, it's a treacherous track. I don't know if you've ever been on a road trip that took you, you ever go the wrong way. You remember those old school maps? Remember those maps that you just like unfold and have them all across the dash like this right here and then take you, you know, two rest stops to get it folded back up because you couldn't figure it out? Now we got everything on our phones. You know what, you, you know what happens when you go in a direction that your phone, your GPS wasn't expecting you to go? You get ignored with that, or you, you know, start ignoring that, and you get annoyed with that. Recalculating, recalculating, U-turn, do a U-turn. Stupid person, do a U-turn, you know, like constantly. My, my voice on my GPS is set up to sound like a British person. I don't know why I did that. I think they just sound smarter, you know. You ever get a hard time on a trip? They're going through difficult time to get to where God wants them to go. And that's why I was so impressed a while ago to pray that prayer. After singing that song, take me, take me where there are no borders, basically. Just really? Because that's a hard trip. That's a big confession and prayer. And we best not be lying about it because that is a treacherous journey that may lead to some places we didn't think we would ever want to be. And we'll see that happen here in just a moment. So we see then this physical challenge. We see the relational challenge. Now let's get to the, to the huge chunk right here. Um, they get to stop number three. Stop number three is in Pisidian uh, Antioch. And there were many Antiochs in those days. And they, they labeled it Pisidian Antioch because they don't want it to be confused with Antioch, of which we've already talked about back in chapter 12. 
And so this is Pisidian Antioch. Where's this place at? It's an incredibly influential place. Um, there's a reason why Paul would travel 100 miles and climb 3,600 feet in elevation to get there. This is an economic powerhouse of, a, of an area. Uh, this was an influential place. Paul has a strategy to take the gospel to influential places. And from those influential places, the gospel will begin to spread. And we'll see that here in just a moment. It'll spread all over the place. And so he's going into Pisidian Antioch because this is such an influential place. Now look at verse 15. Now, we saw in verse 14 that they went into the synagogue and sat down. In verse 15, after the reading of the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, you can speak. Now, they just gave, they just gave a preacher a microphone. <laughs> uh, somebody wanted me to come speak at a youth camp one time, and they told me I had 10 minutes. And I said, no, thank you. I, I, I can't even introduce myself in 10 minutes. I can't even get in. No, no, I'm not doing it. They give Paul the microphone. Why would they do that? Well, some of you may be curious to answer that question. You know, they, they probably did that because they know who Paul is, and they know um, who, whom Paul had trained under. If you'll remember, Gamaliel was the top like one of the top rabbis of that time. And Paul trained under that um, leadership and that influential individual. And so here they're like, that guy, Paul is here. Let's give him an opportunity to speak. Now, I don't know that they were necessarily anticipating the message. Now, Paul, we're going to unpack the message. There are three big points in the message, three big sections, and we'll look at it. You guys ready? If you're taking notes, it'll be clearly up on the screen. The very first part of the message would be like the introduction, and basically it's his preparation. He's telling them that the Christ is coming, okay? This is the big introduction in verse, starting in verse 16. If you look down at verse 16. Paul stood up and motioned with his hand and said, which gives the, it makes it okay to preach with our hands. So <laughs> Paul stood up and motioned with his hand and said, fellow Israelites and you who fear God, listen. So there's a, there's a statement there. You who fear God. So there was not just Jews in the room. There were also those who would be Gentiles, but they are what are called God fearers. There may be some of you in the room right now. You have a, you have a respect for God. You might say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I hear that all the time. You might say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. So I'm kind of open, kind of interested. And so we have these people. It's a little more than that here, but uh, it's a, they're God-fearers. He says, fellow Israelites, God fears, or fear God. Listen, the God of this people, Israel, chose our ancestors, uh, chose our ancestors, made the people prosper during their stay in the land of Egypt, and led them out in a, with a mighty arm. In verse 18, and for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. This all took about 450 years. After this, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Verse 21. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. After removing him, he raised up David as their king and testified about him. I have found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after my own heart, who will carry out all my will. Verse 23. From this man's descendants, as he promised, God brought to Israel the Savior Jesus. Before his coming to public attention, John had previously proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Now, as John was completing his mission, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not the one, but one is coming after me, I, and I am not worthy to untie the sandals on his feet. This is a, this is a recount. So, so Paul is basically giving them a recount of their history, of their Jewish history, of where God had brought them together and where God had brought them up until this point. There's several ideas I want you to make sure you understand here. If you look at all the verbs that are in this, all the action words, one, one good uh, principle in reading Scripture and interpreting Scripture is to look for the action, action words, the verbs. Uh, I, I don't know them as verbs. I just say action words, you know, because I'm still in kindergarten. Uh, but you're just looking, you're looking for the action words. But what you'll notice here is that who's the subject of almost every single action word? It's God. And Paul is driving the point home. That history is God's story. It's 
his story. And we see how God was just intimately involved in every aspect of their history. That there were not, there's nothing that happened on accident because God doesn't do random things. God is on purpose. And he begins to show them how all of God's uh, driving of their history is driving to one person, to one individual. He shows them here throughout this rest of this, this, this sermon how Jesus is the ultimate climax of the Bible. Jesus is the ultimate point of the Bible. We've hammered this over the years, over the couple of years I've been here, but everything in the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus. It is not David and Goliath, so you can go fight your Goliaths. That is not the point of the David and Goliath story or, or you know, piece of history. Here I go calling it a story. The point is not that you can be big and strong or little and, and brave like David and go get some rocks and go conquer the Goliaths in your life. That is not the point. The point is, is that you can never conquer Goliath. You need someone to come and conquer Goliath for you. You need a Savior. That's the point of it. It's pointing us to the ultimate Savior who doesn't let us down like David did, but ultimately conquers death, hell, and the grave, and his name is Jesus. Every story or historical aspect of the Bible is pointing us to the gospel. And that's what Paul is saying. It's similar to when Jesus, when Jesus rose back from the dead, and he's walking, and there's some disciples who he comes upon, some of these men, and, and they're like, um, you don't know what's going on, and he begins to tell them, and it says, from, from the beginning, from Genesis all the way through, he begins to unfold how it all points to him. Entire thing is about him. All of history, all of the scriptures, all of everything is about Jesus and Jesus alone. And so Paul unpacks that and shows them this preparation for the coming of, of Christ. And then he goes into what you might would call a declaration. And then you look in verse, starting in verse 26, a declaration where he talks about Jesus actually dying and coming back from the grave. Because he points it here earlier, he says that it was, that was Jesus is the one who came through the lineage of David, which we have historical records and biblical records that would prove that that Jesus was uh, definitely in the lineage of David, and that God had promised the Messiah would come through that lineage. And so he points to the fact that Jesus is the one, and so that drives him into verse 26 and 27. So look at verse 26. Brothers and sisters, children of Abraham's race, so talking to the Jews, and those among you who fear God, then of course those who are, are interested or you know, want to know more, it is to us, Somebody say us. It is to us that the word of this salvation has been sent. This is, the, this is outside of saying who Jesus is. This is his message. The word of salvation. The word of salvation has been sent. Verse 27. Since the residents of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize him or the sayings of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, they have filled their words by condemning him. They condemned him to what? To a death. Look at verse 28. Though they found no grounds for the death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him killed. And when they had carried out all that had been written about him, they took him down from the tree and put him in a tomb. Look at verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. But God raised him from the dead. And he appeared for many days to those who came, up, um, with, who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we ourselves proclaim to you the good news. The good news. Look at that. Some, just underline, underline it. The good news. That is, that is the gospel. That is what gospel means. Underline good news of the promise that was made to our ancestors. So he goes back and appeals back to the Old Testament promises, the song, or the, out of the Psalms, the other prophecies that are pointing to a Messiah. He says, this is the good news. That was, that was what God was talking about. Look at verse 33. God has fulfilled this for us. He has fulfilled this for us, their children, by raising up Jesus as it is written in the second psalm. Now, the second psalm is considered what's known as a messianic psalm. It is a prophetic psalm. When the Jews would look at that and say, it is talking about a Messiah that's coming. 
And it says this, it's quoted here. You are my son, today I have become your father. As to his raising him from the dead, this is still Paul speaking now, as raising him from the dead, never to return to decay. He has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure promises of David. Therefore, he also says in another passage, you will not let your holy one see decay. Look at verse 36. For David, after serving God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and decayed. But the one God raised up did not decay. Because there were some that would say those psalms are talking about David, that David was the uh, Messiah, that David was the deliverer. But it can't be talking about David if it says that, the, that this person won't see decay. Why? Because David is dead and has been dead for quite some time. And he wants to drive home the point that David's descendant is not dead, that Jesus is very much alive. Now, some of this may be lost on us because we don't have such a rich Jewish background. And this is something that's interesting with Paul. Paul tailors his message. He tailors his message to the audience. He doesn't change the gospel, but he does uh, tailor how he communicates the gospel. And we'll see that throughout the book. He, He goes in at a certain angle, a certain way that will connect with the individuals. Again, some of this may be lost on us, but some of you know that the Old Testament speaks about David a lot. And the and Psalms that David wrote, uh, the majority of them. And many would say that this was talking about him, but Paul says there's no way. There's no way because we know who Jesus is. You know how we know who he is? Because he is alive. And that Psalm's talking about the one that came after him. And his name is Jesus. He's the Messiah. And he'll go on to say, you need to surrender to Jesus. I would say the same thing to us this morning. Jesus is the one that God has promised. Jesus is the one that has come for you. Jesus is the one who who died and rose again three days later. And some of you might be thinking, that is an outlandish story. How do you believe this to be true? Paul talks about it right there, that there were many who saw Jesus. Many who saw Jesus. We see elsewhere in Scripture, uh, 500 or more people saw Jesus. You say, well, okay, well, that's just, the, that's, of course, the Bible's going to say the Bible's true. Okay, that's a fair argument back to me. Maybe you're a skeptic, and that would be type, your type of argument. I get that. But you have to do this, and, and the people, if you're, reg, you're regular here, you know this, and I hammer this home all the time because I want you to have this in your back pocket. I want you to be able to have this, con- have this conversation. You, you've got, you got, so skeptic, individual that may not believe. You think this is all a hoax. You've got to come up with some conclusions. And one of those conclusions is, why would these people be preaching and teaching this message if it wasn't true? What do they gain from standing in front of the people that are going to kill them? And most of them later on will die for this belief. You say, well, people believe things that aren't real all the time. Yeah, but not not knowingly. They're not going to do it knowingly, and they're not going to knowingly take it to their death. That's not, that doesn't happen. You, you got to come up with a reason why the message of Jesus has, has gone for so long. You have to come up with a reason why all of these Jewish men and women would leave Judaism and go to what we know now as Christianity. You got you to come up with a reason for the church and how it has survived for 2,000 years. And so you may be skeptical, and that's okay to have some skepticism, but you have to also look at it from all angles and see that there's a lot going on here that you have to account for if you're going to say it's not true. And so this Jesus, Paul hammers home, this Jesus is alive. Verse 30 would tell us that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the verification. You wonder why Easter is such a big day. That's why, because it is like God cashing the check, depositing the check, saying, yep, certified, this is the deal right here. So it's, a, it's an introduction, it's a declaration, it's an application we see in 38 through 41. This application is, is basically just forgiveness is available, and justification is available. Look at verse 38, look at verse 38. Um, therefore, therefore, so we see when there's a therefore, stupid joke, you got to ask what the therefore is. Therefore, okay. Well, it goes along with Paul, the way Paul writes. Look at Romans, look at other passages of the Bible where Paul will take a book and he'll He'll give a a lot of background and a lot of theology, and then you'll see the phrase, therefore, 
Okay, all of this, we do this now because of all of that. Because all of that is true, therefore, this is what we need to do about it. Okay, um, therefore, in Romans, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, therefore, therefore is a transition. And so he says it uh, very clearly, um, uh, this therefore in verse 38, therefore, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, and through this, that, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. Everyone who believes is justified through him from everything you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. So everyone can be forgiven, everyone can be free, everyone can be justified, everyone can be in a right relationship with God because, what he's saying is because no one can keep the law of Moses. Uh, You you and I have a law inside of our own head, and it's actually influenced by God, of course. Uh, We have a law, and we don't even keep up with our own standard. Anybody here, you you got a standard of what you want in your life, and you don't keep up to it? Am I the only, I am the only honest person I can't keep up with my own standard, let alone God's standard. I can't be perfect in my own self. I definitely can't be perfect like God wants me to be perfect. And that's why you and I needed someone to be perfect for us. And so our faith and trust in Jesus brings justification. It's been commonly said that justification means just as if I've never sinned. It's also could be rightly said, just as if I had never done anything wrong. Like the slate is wiped clean. It's too good to be true, I know. I know. But it is a simple faith and trust in Jesus. If you're familiar with uh, Scripture, you'll be familiar that Galatians is very similar to this. Saved by grace through faith. Paul unpacks this in Galatians and sends that letter back to this region because this is the region of Galatia. It's all tied together. Salvation is available to all of us. All of us can be saved and freed from sin. All of us can have a right relationship with God. Let me ask this question as we start closing things up. How do you handle your guilt? How do you handle your shame? Well, some people go to therapy. Some people drink a lot. How do you handle your guilt? Some people binge out on Netflix. How do you handle your guilt? Some people dive headlong into some destructive hobby or what have you. How do you handle your shame? Because God says that Jesus is the one who will take all of that away. You can numb it for a little while but it'll still be there. And he goes on. He's like, don't, don't go the way of those who would, don't reject this. Don't reject this. Look at, look at verse 39. Everyone who believes is justified. Look at verse 40. So beware. Beware. What does that mean? It means there's danger. It means something really bad's going to happen. Beware that what is said in the prophets does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, marvel and vanish away because I am doing a new, I'm doing a work in your days, a work that you will never believe even if someone were to explain it to you. Beware. If you're not a Christian today, beware because Christ is offering you eternal life. Beware. Beware. That if you have a hard heart and you do not accept this message, you will face eternal death and eternal separation from God. As they were leaving, the people urged them to speak about these matters the following Sabbath. After the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts of Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking with them and urging them to continue in the grace of God. The following Sabbath, I love this, Almost the whole town assembled to hear the word of the Lord. May that be so, Father. May that be so. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what Paul was saying and insulting him. You know why they were contradicting? And you know why they turned to insults? Because they didn't have a way to argue Paul. Uh, As an aside for a moment, it's political season. It always seems to be political season, doesn't it? 
beware of the attack ads that are only attacking character and not the, not the, uh, not the platforms. If a politician can only attack the character, they have no argument to go against. They have no, they have no solution to what the other politician's saying. And it is a lame way to gain votes by attacking the person. Just a free one. Verse 46, Paul and Barnabas, um, verse 45, but when the Jews saw that, the, you know, they contradicted Paul, they started insulting him. Verse 46, Paul and Barnabas boldly replied, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. Since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we are turning to the Gentiles. And I would say this, please, friends, don't reject this. Verse 47, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles to bring salvation to the end of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and honored the word of the Lord. And all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. Friends, listen, God has his chosen. He does. He has his chosen people. He has his people. And this is a, this is a promise here of why, this is a proof of why or a, a foundational why, a reason why I try to share the gospel all the time because God has his people and you are guaranteed success. People will surrender to the gospel. God has his people. You feel uncomfortable about that type of phrasing. Well, you need to know that the book of Acts is completely filled with God's sovereignty all the way through, all the way through. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. The first thing that came to my mind was that crazy kudzu up in Georgia that just can't get. We actually, we pulled a bunch of ferns out of the yard this weekend. Ferns that were just like going crazy all over the place. Don't plant them things. Don't plant those. Those are crazy. They don't belong here. They're not native, apparently. They're from another country and, you know, they, you know whatever. It just spread. Spread in a good way. The gospel just spread. Constant, just flowing through. But the Jews incited prominent God-fearing women, which just made me laugh when I read that, and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their district. But Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off their feet against them and went to Iconium, verse 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Friends, I'm telling you, we need to do some hard things. There's something about suffering for God and, and spreading the gospel that does what? That brings joy. That brings joy. I hope you've had joy on some road trips over the years. But there's no road trip like tripping with God. That's a weird way to say it. There's no road trip like doing a road trip with God. I promise you. You know, Paul had a mission, and his mission originally was to kill Christians. And much like many of us, we have put our, our emphasis into the wrong mission. We have, we have sought the wrong purpose with our life. And God says, man, it's time to go. It's time to get in the game. It's time to go. It is time to take this gospel. And here we go. Some of them were intrigued. Some of them were enraged. Some of them believed. Some of them were intrigued at the gospel. They wanted to hear more about it. Some of them were enraged about it because when you come face to face with what the gospel is saying, it's saying that you're not a good person. You can't be good. And that, that makes people really mad. And also that it attacked their entire belief system. So some people are intrigued. I want to hear more. Some people are enraged. I want to kill you. And some people accepted it. But here's the thing. There is no room for you and I to be apathetic about it. Lackadaisical, ah, oh, whatever, I don't care. That is an unintelligent response to this message. You are showing, friend, if you are apathetic about the gospel, maybe it's right, maybe it's not, or if you've confessed that you're a Christian, but there's no thing in your life that even ever comes to a resemblance of that at all, you are revealing a hard heart and an unintelligent mind. You're like, that's kind of offensive. Welcome to Paul. 
There's no room for apathy. C.S. Lewis said it like this, one of the most brilliant people ever. He said it this way, the quote will be on the screen. Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. It just can't. And so every one of us have to deal with that. Do you believe it? Do you not believe it? Do you want some more information about it? Let's talk. My favorite conversations are conversations about who Jesus is. You've got questions. You're a skeptic. Let's talk about it. This morning, we're going to close things out just praying. We're going to close things out in prayer. And we're going to close in a way where you can take a moment and just sit there and be silent before the Lord. So let's bow our heads for a moment. Let's just think about what you've heard this morning. Father God, I pray that your spirit would move in our hearts today. God, I pray that you would, you would bring joy in following you today. Father, I pray that the Christians in the room, God, would be men and women unafraid and unashamed of the truth of what we've just read. I pray, God, that we would be unafraid. God, give boldness. And Father, I pray, Lord, right now, for anyone in the room that would say, I don't believe, I pray, God, that they would. I pray that you would make their hearts come alive. I pray, God, that they would know you. I pray, God, that they would want to surrender to you right now. God, I pray that you would save, save them. And Father, I pray for us collectively as a church. Make us men and women, boys and girls, who are unafraid and unashamed to follow you. God, we step out. I pray that we will step out. And Father, when we step out, you step up. I know that is true. God, we will not be alone. Bring that joy into this place. God, we love you. We give our lives to this message. We love you. We're thankful. Your heads are bowed and eyes are closed for just a moment. Just a moment. And maybe the Lord's speaking to your heart right now, and I just want you to respond. Respond that God would do these things in your life. And if you're not a Christian, respond in faith and trust, believing that Jesus died for your sins and that you can be justified. I'd encourage you to pray a prayer of confession, something that might say, God, I know I'm a sinner and I am guilty before you. Pray something like, God, I believe you sent your son. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin. Tell God, I believe what you did counted for me. I believe you rose again. I confess you as my Lord, and I surrender to you. Friends, if you're praying that type of confession, that type of prayer, if the Lord's doing that in your heart, you can have the assurance, you can know, you can have assurance that you have peace inside yourself and peace with God. And if that is you, when I say amen, I really would like to have a conversation just to pray with you and encourage you. Father, we love you and are thankful for what you're doing. We praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen, amen. If you've come this morning to continue uh, worshiping by giving, uh, those offering boxes are mounted on the back. Friends, if you're a guest with us this morning, thank you for being here. Uh, you can turn those cards in the back if you want more information. Let me close us off or close us out with this uh, phrase or this statement here from the, the book of 2 Corinthians, the very last verse. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.